we'll do one more day of geometry and then, and then think about what's next. So if you recall, there was one problem that we didn't finish, and this was this problem of blowing candles. Did anybody try this? No? Someone actually solved it in uh, Sunday. Yeah? It was Daniel, and uh -huh. his solution was very unique. Okay, all right. Let's first discuss this, and then maybe we'll check out his solution as well. Uh, how many, any of you remember this problem? So the problem was that you're given a... Let's see. You're given a cake, and on the cake were a bunch of candles, and the, uh, the birthday boy or girl, I don't know, uh, uh, could blow the cake, but, uh, but could blow the cake only in one direction, and uh, the blow uh, was always, uh, uh, what's the word for it? I, I, uh, it? Anyone remember how it was described? As a, as a rectangular strip? Right, a rectangular strip, right? Uh, so he or she would blow air and it would go straight down, right? And the question was, uh, uh, what's the minimum width of this, uh, of this blowing action that's needed to blow out all the candles? Uh, so your candles are sitting on a cake. You have to blow his job. Uh, the birthday boy had to blow out all the candles at once. And the blowing could only happen along a strip, along a, uh, uh, along a straight strip. And you wanted to know what's the minimum width that was required to blow all the candles. Okay. So uh, this is just to give you a sense of the, of the problem. Let's say you're only five candles sitting like this then the convex hull would look like that. So the convex hull is essentially the smallest convex polygon that contains all the points. If you wanted the smallest rectangle by area that covers all of this, there's, there's that. Here is something that's the smallest rectangle by width. Uh, so if you, if you take a rectangle and if you keep turning it around, then you'll find that the shortest width is along this direction. So all the birthday boy had to do was to stand in this direction and blow this way and he or she would get the, get the narrowest width, right? And so the job was to find that. Then there are also the, the smallest circle, the smallest envelope. So there are lots of interesting questions one can ask, but we're asking this question. Is that clear? Okay. Any questions about this? All good? Okay. So, so what's, what's the plan? How would you approach it, not how Danielle would approach it? Uh, what would be your approach? So it looks like you have to try every possible angle and then figure out what the minimum width, what the width is. But how can one check every possible angle? That doesn't seem possible. We can try to find the farthest points. Sorry? We can try farthest, farthest points, points. points and then what? Yeah, that's the tricky part. You have to make a line. So let's say I can find this, but how is that going to help you? Because you want the narrowest, not the farthest. Well, I. Any thoughts? So, so do you do you have any any thoughts on why you think you want the farthest pair? Yeah, because it's going to give us the. You think something perpendicular to that would be the narrowest? Is that what you're thinking? Maybe a line 
is perpendicular to two points points? Yeah, so you're saying if, if this is the farthest pair, then, per, uh, uh, well, in this case, actually, it's along that direction that it seems to get the narrowest, uh, maybe. Not sure. Wait, what's the difference between the rectangle by width and the envelope? The envelope, everything has to be parallel to the axis. That's actually easy. You just take the lowest x coordinate and the lowest y coordinate. Yeah. Uh, it was to start with the lowest x and y coordinate. Okay. And, uh, so here's my lowest x coordinate. Sorry, lowest y coordinate and the lowest x coordinate. What do you? What am I going to do with that? I'm sorry, lowest uh, y coordinate and lowest, uh, highest y coordinate. Oh, lowest y and highest y. That looks like those two. All right. <laughs> which yeah. Covers all the points. Angle. Angle. Uh, what do I do with angle? Doesn't seem to help very much, does it? Any thoughts at all? Not clear, right? Uh, you have any thoughts, sir? Uh, so, I mean, you, I saw you've this. seen this before. I, I've yeah. Seen this before. So okay, so don't tell us the solution, but tell us a bad solution. <laughs> a bad solution? <laughs> I mean, a solution that works. Tell us a solution that works. Doesn't have to be a good solution. Maybe if you pick up all pairs of points, uh -huh. that's sort of like you get an angle from this. Okay, good. So, uh, uh, so let's start there. So, uh, everyone understood what his uh, what his suggestion was. Take every pair of points, and then what? Sorry. And then this gives you an angle. This gives you an and angle. You okay. Sort of so you're going to treat that as a as a as perpendicular to the direction you want to blow, or or, or yes. what? Okay. Yeah, uh, parallel. 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 Is in the same direction. <laughs> so it's an angle relative to what? So you, if you, let's say like. Um, so so l let me try and, and restate what he's suggesting. You want to find the narrowest width. Okay. Because you want a width of uh, uh, width of this. Uh, uh, actually, it's just a, it's called, but it, it, the, its definition is width of the polygon. Okay, so you want because uh, if you put a rectangle around it, that's the that's the narrowest width you can get. Okay, what it's asking is. Uh, a, in order to find the width of a polygon, there must be at least one vertex on either side, right? Seems obvious, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're leaving gaps there, you're nuts, right? You're just making it too big. So it must be tight, so it must be touching the polygon. So therefore, at least one vertex must be on either side. So if this is the narrowest width, then one, one vertex must be on that side and one vertex must be on this side, right? You, you believe this at least, right? So then, um, uh, can't I try every possible pair and then do what? Then maybe I look perpendicular to that, something like that? Maybe like, a, so if, if you look at the envelope, yeah. and let's say you pick the top two points, Right. In the same line. Right. This creates a sort of like a, yeah. a line horizontal to the y-axis. Yeah, yeah. And you have to, if everything's to on one side of it, yeah. then you can just expand the line down. So okay. this is my candle with the with just the, the cake cut out, but only the points where the candles are. OK. Uh, does anyone have a pen I can borrow? 
Yeah, uh, marker pen would be would be better if you have one. You don't. Okay, then I'll borrow whatever pen you have. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to mark these mark these vertices where the candles are. It's right at these corners. Maybe even put down a number there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, hey Demba, eight, and nine. Let me see if I can put it on this. See anything? Um, come on, behave. Oh, yeah, this got it turned somehow. Mm. Okay, well, I'm getting there. Uh, how do I make this smaller? Come on. Oh, it can't get any smaller. OK. All right. You see all this? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are nine, nine candles. There was a bigger cake that I've eaten. And that's all that's left. So if I want to find the width, meaning the, the right direction in which to blow in such a way that I, I have the narrowest uh, 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 strip, then how do, I, how do I do this? So, so one possibility is that, remember as, as uh, Ricky said, maybe you want to find every pair of vertices and see if somehow that determines a, 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 a strip for you. So if I want to start at one, if, if let's say one is one of my points, then uh, what I could do is to find a, so think of one as, uh, as something uh, on the table, okay? Uh, let me actually move it down so that it, it's right at this tip here. All right, cool. So, so now the question is, how do I make the height as low as possible, right? You believe this? Uh, so, so I want the, uh, I actually want the minimum of the maximum distance. Does that make any sense? Yes. Because I want to, uh, I want to find, if one is part of my, the, uh, uh, the, the, one of the edges of the strip, I want to know what's the smallest height I can get so that then I could, I could use my vertical as the strip where I'm, I'm going to blow the candles. Is that clear? Oh crap, sorry. <sighs> okay, uh, so what do I do? How do I find the partner for one where the distance would be minimized uh, or the height would be minimized? Because then I could do it with two and then I three and then four and I could try with all of them. Does that make sense? So how do I find the, the minimum height that, uh, that, uh, the, so that I can put the whole cake in a box now, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and then blow along this direction. So imagine that I'm trying to blow along, along the uh, uh, parallel to the x-axis, okay? And one is one of the sides of the polygon, of, the, of that blow strip. And I want to know what's on the other end. And remember, there has to be a vertex there, right? Because otherwise, you, you're going to be able to squeeze it more. So question is, which vertex? And there are only n minus 1 other vertices to try, right? 
So I could check one and two. Could two be the other end? If, if two were the other end, there's, uh, there's no way I can, I can uh, uh, if, I if I take one and two to be the, the, uh, the two, the two uh, uh, horizontal lines, I won't capture the whole, all the candles. It can't be one three, it can't be one four, it could be one five, uh, that would capture everything and then none of this work. So it's clearly one five here. But then I could also turn this thing, right? I could keep one along the x-axis, but I could turn and make it like that. Uh, now what? Now it's, well, it, it seems like it's still five, right? Because I just have to look at the highest y-coordinate after I've rotated it. Right? So, uh, so if I lay one and two along this, then the other side has five. That gives me a width. And then I could now try with, uh, with, with two as, my, as, my, uh, uh, as, as lying on the x-axis. And this time it'll be six. And I can keep turning this until two, three lies on, on the x-axis. And, and now from six, it's gone to seven. And then I could turn it some more until, until three. Uh, and at each point, I could figure out what is the, what is the farthest uh, uh, y-axis or the highest y-axis, y-coordinate. And then keep, keep doing this until three and four comes flat on the table. Does that make sense? Is this making sense? So it sort of gives us a plan of action, but I have no idea how to, how to implement this. So this is where I'm looking for ideas. First of all, is this strategy making any sense to you? Because I fixed what one side of the strip is, which is the, which is the bottom of this table, right? And I am figuring out what the top is and each time I'd like it to be as low as possible so that I'll, it'll give me the narrowest strip. And I keep rotating it until I find that. Uh, the problem still is that there are infinite number of positions I would have to try. Right? So how do I figure out the, the best? Mm -hmm. It seems like when it's flat, it's, it's going flat. to be the minimum. You guys believe him? Can you repeat? Want to repeat? When, uh, before he started with three and then like a little rotated, you can show like that. Perfect. So um, as he rotates it more and the two points are flat. Mm -hmm that distance is minimized. So, so here it's four to eight, right? Mm -hmm. Then somewhere here it's four to nine. Then somewhere here it's still four to nine. But the distance from, the, the, the distance between that, those two horizontal lines has gone down. So do you believe him that, that the distance is best when it's flat on one of the sides? and not sitting on one vertex like that? Why would you even believe this? Kind of makes sense because the top point is always going to go down, right? Uh, why are you convinced of that? Thanks. Maybe like the like diagonal then. Yeah. Maybe like a spike mode. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. Simple square, and if we put it on a tip, then diagonal it would be larger, and if we put it on a side, then it will be smaller. Right. So, so uh, uh, it may be useful for you to think in terms of what we were doing. We were, we kept four as some kind of a center, and then we were rotating, right? 
So the distance 4 to 9 is fixed, right? But yet, as you turned, uh, the uh, 4 to 9 was the, uh, we know is the farthest distance, okay? Uh, but it becomes less as, as this side becomes uh, more and more horizontal. How can we prove this? Maybe we, uh, there's like a triangle. When so there is some triangle. So a triangle has this vertex, whatever the vertex, in this case it was vertex 4. Mm -hmm. We'll keep it as 4. Um, and we also know that 4 is farthest away from 9. That seems believable, right? Maybe. Um, and 9 is sitting somewhere here. But then as we rotate this, 9 seems to flatten out. So there is a point where 9 is, will give you the, the maximum width, right? Because that would be when 9 is right on top of 4. Well, actually, for 4, it's not 9, it's 8. Sorry. So let's, let's change our, our discussion here to 8. So for 4, the farthest guy seems to be 8. Yeah? And then as we rotate it, 8 is getting, uh, uh, the, the y coordinate of 8 is, is coming down for sure because it was maximum when it was right on top of 8, so top of 4, right? You believe this. When you start to rotate this, clearly it's a circle, so it's going to come down. So its y coordinate is going to come down a little bit, right? Uh, uh, and uh, it's, so that means the width of the polygon is going to come down a little bit in this direction. Now, when will it stop? It'll stop when either this side here becomes flat or the next vertex becomes higher than 8. Does that make sense? Right? Are we adding an extra rule now? Sorry? Is this an extra rule or is it? No, I'm just telling you, giving you some intuition. You, you have to tell me whether you believe ma me or not. And it's okay to say I don't believe you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, once again, we know that for 4, 8 is the farthest guy. We can figure this out, let's say. Yeah? Now, as, I, uh, as long as it's vertical, the, uh, uh, and if I think of a, 4 sitting on a table like so, then I know that 8 is going to be at the highest, 8 is going to be the highest point. Fine? Now I, I start to turn the polygon until something hits. Well, so either this side hits or 8 is no more the highest point. Why are we considering the second thing, that 8 is no more the highest point? Because well, you can see that it happens because I am turning this, right? I am turning it and I am turning it and I am turning it at some point 8, 9 becomes horizontal and now 8 goes lower than 9 and I haven't yet hit the uh, hit the side for the bottom bottom edge. You believe this? Yeah. That's, that's okay so that's the reason why we're talking about it because now I get a smaller width than before. Remember 8 was the farthest guy it's now uh, not at the at the zenith, but it has kind of come down, and nine, which is much low, which was much lower, is right uh, at the at the top, and therefore its distance must be must be smaller. So therefore, this is already giving you a smaller width. I think the key is it's for the same vertex. Okay? It's what? It's still I'm still at four. Correct. I'm okay. still pivoting around four. The 
I can mo I can lower it further. My arguments will continue, but I'm telling you why I'm doing what I'm doing. How we do this and how we figure out which is the right point is, is a different matter, but first you guys need to build some intuition as to what we are trying to do. And I'm trying to give, give you some intuition. Yes, Demba. Yeah, a four and three, like like that. You mean? Yeah. Okay, you prefer that? All right, let's see that. Sure. Highest point. In this case, it's eight. Right? Seems like it's eight. But depending on what direction you go, it does change. Yeah. So for four, three, for three, four, it was eight. And then I continue to turn it this way, and it was just eight. And then somewhere here, it became, the, the highest point became 9. And then uh, it, it's now 9. And then I can continue. Now I'll start pivoting around 5, right? So let me move this here. And when I do this, it, it quickly becomes 1 at some point. And then I continue to do so. And soon you'll see it's all also 2. And then uh, where by the time I, I have 5 and 6 flat on the table, it's, it's, it's still two. And then I can continue to turn, and soon it'll become three, and then it'll move to seven. Uh, so now it's, uh, well, it's still two, um, but somewhere here it'll become three, hopefully, right? Um, so I keep doing this until I get that, and it, now it's, it's clearly three, and I continue to now move at, at eight, and I will get uh, yeah, somewhere here it's already four, and then uh, 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 I, it's still four. Then if I turn some more, it'll become five, and so on. And now we're back to our position one. How did that help you? You have some brilliant ideas for us now? Uh, no, I just, I just <laughs> You made me do all that work. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's the y coordinates that we are interested in. Remember, we are trying to find the narrowest strip. Mm -hmm. That's the width of the polygon. That contains okay. the whole polygon. Another way to think about it is I'm allowed a narrow box and I want to you I want to package this in the narrowest box possible. Uh, imagine going to the to the post office and they say, hey, your cost is proportional to, your, to, to the, to the uh, width of the box you're going to use. If you can pack it in a really, really narrow box, it'll cost you a lot less. So how do you minimize your cost? Does that make sense? So, uh, so therefore, what did you learn from this? <laughs> Yeah, we have to prove, and then flattens down. That's when you get the minimum um, y distances between whatever the height is for that point. Like for instance, for nine. Yeah. In this case, five will be its pair. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now I fully understand the problem. I don't have a proof yet, but I'll <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. If you understood the problem, that's that's already some something good. Yeah. Was this? Did this help you to to understand things better? All right. So so why is Ricky's intuition right? Somehow it, he says that you get better uh, width if one of the sides is flat on on the on the table. We're, well, we are not considering. I was just showing you what happens so that you know what, wh why you want that. We haven't yet proved it, remember. Is it because one of the sides of the polygon can coincide with that side? Well, that's part of the things we are trying to prove. Is that even true that we have to have one of the sides along, along the table? Is that, is that what you were asking? Yeah, because I was thinking you could take the, uh, you could take the equation of every 
design. Yeah. That's equivalent to yeah, yeah. Now you're telling me how to solve it. Let's get to that in a, in a couple of minutes. But why should this give you one of the? Why should one of these give you the answer? That's the question. Right? You were going to say something? I was going to say because it maximizes the number of points that are on the edges, which would minimize the width. Why? Uh, not sure. I, 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 w why do I have to believe you? <laughs> if you, if you uh, if, uh, they, uh, put the longest side on oh. the you want to put the longest along the side. But yeah. but even, uh, why should I put any side along the bottom? That's the question. Yeah? Um, one thing I can think of is that, like for instance, let's say one is not on the side, right? That means that one is gaining some extra y, some extra y values, right? Mm -hmm. So by putting one to the side, at least I know for a fact that we are minimizing one, like the, which is the point. Like for instance, in the diagram, we have we have one right there, right? Yeah. So if one is not flat, yeah, that means we, um, like we're giving y an advantage. Like we have some positive values of y that we can still minimize, right? So by making it flat, that means we've shifted at least one coordinate, the all the y values down, and that will then affect it. All the other coordinates and I, I'm, uh, I, I think I missed you somewhere, so start again, sorry. Like, you see how we have one, and then if it wasn't flat, yeah. the y coordinates of one will not be... Um, it's not going to... Well, why... Uh, uh, you mean uh, if you turn it on, on nine? Yes, if we turn okay. it on nine, it will not so, be uh, Well, l let's, let's do all the discussions with one as, as our base point. We're always rotating with respect to one. So, uh, so essentially, if, if Ricky's claim is right, either this side or this side should be on the table, right? Yes. Now, the question is why one of those two sides is somehow sacred, right? Why one of those two sides should be the, the two things, two angles we should consider. Why don't we consider something in between? This is, a, this is what we have to answer. You're going to say something? I'm going to say, I think I understood what you're saying. Okay. Saying that for that is going to be when it's when it's so so you're saying that either this or this is going to give you the minimum height for, for one this is your for one for yeah. i will say for for the pair of one and two because otherwise no two for for one and two it gives you something then uh, it gives you a certain height then I keep one one the same and I try to rotate. I know I'm not doing a good job of, of rotating with one there. And if I roll it, right, it'll give me a, a different height. Now what, what happened in between were all things that were greater. Is this true? If that is true, then, then, the, then Ricky's claim is done, right? Um, so how do we figure this out? Uh, mm, not sure how to how to even draw this. <laughs> um, no, we can't do it here. I don't think so. So we have one here, right? Uh, and let's look at it this way. For one, there is a farthest point. There is a farthest vertex, which which is independent of how we turn this, because that's just part of the, that's just a property of the polygon. In this case, it's not hard to see that five is the farthest. Okay, um, uh, so if I if I don't put it on a, on one of the sides, then five will be way up on top. Now, if I keep turning this, five is going to drop because I'm rotating it, right? And if I turn it the other way, again, five is going to drop because I'm rotating it. Um, so therefore, its Y coordinate will come down. And unless some other vertex starts to beat five, you're gonna see that it's, uh, uh, that uh, having 
one five as a vertical line is not a great idea. Okay, and that you can you can you can reduce the width by by turning it until something happens. And what is that something? So for that something, maybe there's actually a better way to do this. Let me see if I can if I can figure this out. So I'm going to do that. Now I've got that is my width. If one is if one is uh, uh, one is sitting on the table, and five is right on top of it, this is this we know is the maximum width, and clearly we are not interested in this. We want to minimize the width, right? So if I now rotate it either this way or this way, I know I'm not going to go above that that box, that white box that I have there, because I'm just rotating at at one, right? You believe this? So if I rotate it this way. I'm, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's clearly reducing the, um, uh, uh, the, the maximum y coordinate, but, and I can bring that down, but I can only bring it down until either the, the horizontal, until two goes flat on the, on the table, or it hits six on the other side. One of these two things must stop it. Does that make sense? So in this case, we were able to get two flat on the table and we still haven't hit six. And so now I am going to uh, rotate with two as my, as my pivot point. So I'm going to now continue to do so and you'll see that the y coordinate will start to drop, but this has gone up, uh, but I've got one edge on the, on the other side instead. All right. So, so what we'll see is as we rotate, either we're going to get an interesting case where something is flat on the bottom side, or there's something flat on the top side. In each of these cases, your, your, your configuration is changing in terms of which ones are determining the width. So in this case, the width is determined by two and the edge five, six. And so, uh, uh, now, if I turn it a little bit more, it'll actually go up because remember, as I, as I turn this more, six is going to go up a little bit. So, uh, so things could go up, but then uh, eventually you'll get either two, three becoming flat or six, seven becoming flat. Okay. And, and so what will happen is that uh, in this case, it'll probably be uh, what I'm not sure. In this case, it's six, seven, that'll, that'll probably win, right? And I need to move this up a little bit more. Yeah, so six, seven became flat and, and I, can, I can stop right there. Can I ask something? So six, seven becoming flat on top is the same as six, seven becoming flat at the bottom? Yeah, actually it is, yeah. Uh, and uh, why is that so? Because, because, uh, because, I don't know. Because, yeah. Well, remember, we are, we are assuming that the, that the width that we are interested in is along, is, is parallel to the x-axis. What happened here? Yeah. yeah. How do I get this now? <laughs> okay. No. Well, what happened here? What are all those things? I know it's a menu. How do I get rid of the menu? Come on, do something. Is there a mouse? There is a mouse here somewhere. I don't think so. Live viewer.
Okay, I turned it off. And now What do you mean half of? Oh, because one side is going up and the other side is going down. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes, and then all the ones on that side are decreasing. This could be going down. Yeah. To the lowest they can possibly get. When when the closest point to the point they are rotating, when it reaches zero, y equals zero. So everything is otherwise. And when you rotate to the other side, then we do the same thing for the points that were increasing. And then. Yeah. Yeah, let me see if I can explain it in a different way. I can't seem to get, well, you, uh, this is the best I can do for you. <laughs> uh, all right, so, uh, so what we were saying was if, if only once one vertex is on, the, uh, is on the table, then your best uh, width is going to be when one of the sides is is on the is on the other end, and uh, the other case when you will have a small width is when uh, uh, when the uh, for this vertex uh, either it's the the next edge or the previous edge that's flat on the table, and you have a vertex uh, that's that's uh, determines the uh, the width of the of the polygon. Uh, this is what you're you're going to see. Um, uh, just because if it is not, okay, then what do we know? We know that the width is determined by only two single vertices, a vertex here and a vertex here. Okay, so we're assuming that what Ricky said is not true, that neither on this side nor on this side you have a flat edge. So let's see if we can prove this by contradiction. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, yeah, because eventually it'll come down. Yeah. That's, that's correct, uh, but I just wanted to make sure that people see this, this intuition. Uh, but we do need to consider the case when, when uh, there is no edge on both sides. That's why I wanted to show that picture, okay? So, uh, so let's assume that, that Ricky's statement is not true, that you don't have an edge on one of the flat sides then you only have single vertices. Well, why do you at least have vertices? Because otherwise you can bring it down, right? If this were not a vertex, if the nearest vertex were here, clearly you can bring that down. So there's at least one vertex there, there's at least one vertex here, that's pretty clear. And this determines the width. The, uh, uh, but there is no flat edge that, uh, of the polygon along either of these, which means that your flat edges are going to look something like so. So your flat edges are going to look like that and like that. Is that clear? So now we can see pretty clearly that there is room to rotate, right? 
So if we rotate it this way on, on this vertex, then one of two things will happen. Either this edge will hit the, hit the bottom first, or that edge will, will, will become the top edge. One of these two things has to happen. Whichever angle, if this angle is smaller, that'll hit first. If this angle is smaller, that angle will, will hit first. But either way, as you rotate, this guy is coming down. Now, of course, it's possible that this guy is, uh, if, if I draw a vertical line here, it's possible that this vertex is actually to the left and not to the right. If it were here, then I would go the other way. Right? Either way, I'm going to rotate it until one of the edges hits either this side or this side of the strip. And the uh, y coordinate of this top point must go down. Do you believe this now? That's about the simplest argument I can make. I, it's not a formal proof, but it's, it's close enough to give you enough intuition. Is that, does that make sense? So that's why we, have, we can be guaranteed that there's going to be an edge. And so now this gives us a, a clean algorithm because what we can do is for a given vertex, so we'll, we'll lay, lay an edge on the bottom side. So let's start with one and two. Okay, here's one and two. And for one and two, we're going to try and find the vertex that has the least y coordinate. All right, uh, that's going to take some work, but it's uh, essentially we may have to rotate everything in order to make one and two along the x-axis, and then all the other coordinates can be figured out. Uh, or you can do it some other way where you uh, you take projections and so on. So uh, this is a, a bit of work. We can talk about this later. Uh, but we lay one and two on the side and figure out the highest point. And then the next thing we do is we rotate this two so that two and three are now flat on the, on the table. And once again, we do the same thing. However, the nice thing now is whatever we got for one and two, right? We, for, for one and two, what did we get? We got, we got vertex five, right? Uh, for two and three, we just have to keep going, uh, what is it, counterclockwise. So for two and three, uh, we just have to search whether six is the highest or is it seven and so on and so forth until we find the highest. And then we're going to rotate this so that we get three, four along the, along the x-axis and we continue from where we left off. Last time it was seven, now it's become eight. And then uh, we'll do this one here and we'll see that we get, we'll get nine. And then we go to the next one and it turns out it doesn't give us, I think it won't give us one, it'll just give us two. Right? And so we are not going to figure it out every time. Instead, we'll just keep rotating until we find the one with the highest, highest y coordinate. And that's the trick. So we'll spend a lot of time figuring out the first one for one, two, and then after that, it's just a continuing sweep, which is the trick to make it a linear time algorithm and, and, and you can solve this problem pretty efficiently. So that leaves us with one important question. That is, for the first one, we are putting one and two along the flat side of the table, right? So we've got one, two along here. This is one, this is two, and everything else is above it. And we just don't know what the polygon is going to look like. And we want to know what's the highest, highest vertex. Is that clear? Actually, let me make it even weirder. Should be the minimum of the heights points, right? It should be minimum of the heights, but remember we have to we have to rotate everything. Yeah. So the question is, how do I rotate? That's, that's part of the problem. Right. Okay. Um, so, so the first thing to do is to move the origin to one. OK. 
okay? And that's simply a translation. So if one had coordinates uh, x1, y1, and if we move it to the origin, then we're making x1, y1 to be 0, 0. So therefore, we'll take every coordinate and subtract x1 from its x coordinate and y1 from its y coordinate. That way, everything will get translated to the origin. The next thing we have to do is to make 2 along the x-axis. So now 2 has some coordinates. Let's call it x2, y2. And we have to make uh, its y coordinate to be 0. So that means we have to take the whole polygon and rotate it so that, so that the y coordinate of this guy is 0. And uh, rotations are done. There are many ways to do this. Uh, <laughs> So you could, you could figure out the polar angle of point number two and make it zero. And that way you'll, you'll, you'll then rotate every other point by that same polar angle, right? Uh, so initially, uh, this polygon may have, been rotate, may have been in some other strange direction, right? So it's possible that, the, that this polygon was sitting like so. Uh, I, I'm not even sure I can draw it for you, uh, but maybe it sat like that, and here is 1, 2. So the first thing I've done is to move 1 to the origin, but now 2 is going off in some strange direction, and so I have to rotate it so that 1, 2 is along the x-axis. And, and so I will make this the origin, and then I will rotate it so that this is along the x-axis. So this angle is what I have to figure out. And I can figure that out by simply looking at the coordinates of 2. Right? If 2 has coordinates x2, y2, then this angle is given by, uh, by tan inverse of, of y2 divided by x2. Is that clear? And so I, once I figure out that angle, then I know that the whole polygon needs to be rotated around, around 1. And, and we know exactly the angle by which it needs to rotate. So you can figure this out. That's one way of doing it. Then there's another way to do it using, using vector algebra. Uh, 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 but I will, I will leave it to you to try and figure this out. If you still have trouble, ask me, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain this in, in some other way. Yeah. All the coordinates, all the coordinates have to change. So this is a fair bit of work just for the first guy. But after that, it turns out that it'll be a lot simpler and, and you can see how that happens. Is that clear? Okay, good. Uh, so, so once I rotate it so that one and two are along the x-axis and one is at the origin, right? Then I, all I have to do is to look at all the y coordinates and find the one with the highest y coordinate. Clear? So for 1, 2, I can figure out the point with the highest y coordinate. Now, how do I go to 2, 3? That's the question. So if 1, 2 has this vertex as the highest y coordinate, then it turns out that in order to do 2, 3, I don't have to go and do all this rotation thing all over again, because if I did that, then I would spend order n time for each iteration, and it would become an order n squared algorithm. Instead, it turns out that I can simply start walking this way and figure out which is the right point that will have the highest y-axis. Y and, and that can be, uh, so I'm going to try and explain that next. Are there any questions before I, I try to get deeper into this? Did I miss any, uh, did I lose people somewhere along the way? All this is fine? Okay. So for 1, 2, we figured out that this guy is the farthest, is the highest y, has the highest y coordinate. Clear? Now I want to take 2, 3 and find the highest y coordinate if you put 2, 3 along the table. Of course, I could do this by rotating it, but then if I rotate it, I have to refigure the coordinates of all the points, and that's going to take me order in time. And if I keep doing this, it'll become too expensive. 
So instead, I'm not going to do all that. Instead, I am going to ask, let me compare this point and this point, and ask the question, which one will be a higher y-coordinate when 2, 3 is along the x-axis? Does that make sense? So what, essentially what I'm going to ask is, uh, is I am going to take a direction perpendicular to this, all right? And then I'm going to project this point and this point on that coordinate and figure out which one is higher. I don't have to do anything else. Did that make sense? Uh, so finding a projection along a different direction is equivalent to doing something called a dot product. Okay. So if you know this direction, you know it's a direction perpendicular to it. How do you, how do, you do that? If, if, uh, if, two, if 2, 3 is along some direction, let's say that, this is typically given by the, remember I, uh, uh, when I talked to you about vectors and, and coordinates, what did I tell you? I told you that vectors and coordinates can be thought of as one and the same for, for all practical purposes. Which means if this is the origin, then the coordinate of this point is exactly the vector from the origin to that point. If it is not, if origin is somewhere else, then you have to do some vector addition, a simple vector addition in order, or a vector subtraction in order to get this. Because this plus this gives you this, which means this guy is equal to this minus this. So if I call this u and v, then uh, this guy here, let's call that x. x is equal to v minus u, because u plus x was v. So if u plus x was v, x is v minus u. So it's a simple vector subtraction to figure out this vector, which means I can figure out that vector. That's my x axis. That should be my x axis. And so I need to find something that's perpendicular to it. And to find something perpendicular to it, I just have to, what do I do? Sorry? Slopes have to multiply to negative one. That's correct. So for a vector, the slope is its y coordinate divided. Y2 minus y1 over x2. That's right. So so yeah. So it's be it's going to be y two y of this guy minus y of this guy divided by x of this one minus x of this one. Once you find that, you can find the one perpendicular to it. So you can find a vector along this direction. Um, uh, another way to do it, because since you don't care about the magnitude so much, there's no need to, to do all that. In fact, you can just take the, uh, the uh, for the vector, whatever is your x and y, simply flip them and, and change one of the signs. Okay? So there's a lot easier way to find this vector. Once you find that vector, you're now taking projections of that guy on that vector. Okay, so you're doing a dot product with of, of uh, uh, the origin to, to, to this point on, on a vector that's along this. And if you do that, it's simply going to give you some point, and that's all you care about. And you need to know whether if I, if I drop this along that, you'll get some point over here, which means you'll get, uh, you'll, you'll get some vector like this. And, and then you take the other one, which in this case is this guy here. Uh, so you take that vector and drop it along, along that perpendicular thing. And this time it'll give you, it'll give you something, along, uh, something like this, which will be that vector. And by comparing these two vectors, you can figure out which one is, is higher than the other one. OK? I know I'm being, uh, I'm trying to go, uh, uh, trying to explain this very intuitively, but you guys have to have to code this up in order to convince yourself it works. Yeah. Um, I see what you're doing at the, this part, but why do you need the beginning rotation? Can you just do this from the beginning? Exactly. I was going to say that. Yeah. Why do you you, uh, no, you can't because you don't know where to start. Here, I knew this one. 
uh, was a start point, and then I was looking at the next one, but and I was looking at the next one. So let's say the, the first line is one, two. Uh huh. So you're saying start from three and then keep searching yeah, keep until searching. you. Yeah, you could do that. You could most certainly do that. Either way, it's going to take you order and time. Yes. Okay. So yeah, whether you do the whole thing and 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 figure it out, or you do it, yeah, you could you could do exactly this. That's correct. Yeah. Sure. So there are a couple of things you have to kind of figure out. One is uh, if, you if you don't want to rotate it uh, using this method, you just want to find projection. Well, first of all, you have to find, a find vectors. Then you need to find vectors that are perpendicular to the these vectors. And then you have to take projections of some other point on, on, that, on, that, on that new vector. These are things that you, know, you should know how to, how to implement. Once you do that, it's, the rest is actually fairly straightforward. Okay. <laughs> one final question. Um, so we, we did all of this, and yeah. um, we started with the convex hole. And w why did they give us r, the radius? Can you find convex hole easier with knowing the radius, or? What oh, you mean why was the cake there at yeah, all? Yeah, why was the cake there at all? The only thing I can think of is that convex hull reduces into something simpler if you know the radius of the cake. No? No. Not that I know of. Yeah, I, I, I can't think of a good reason. Solution. Yeah. Yeah, the cake was completely irrelevant. Yeah. I know. I, I, I think I agree. I'm, uh, but the radius was part of the input? Yeah. I'm wondering if there are places where you get more than one solution and then you have to eliminate one of them. It doesn't. No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it is simply to, to figure out that none of these distances are more than 2R, something like that. Mm -hmm. Not that I know of. I don't think so. I don't think so. Maybe if you rotate it, it when you rotate pointing on the left hand side, the distance is going to be like uh, increased. And in that case, the distance should not, the candle should not go out of the ca cake. Well, the candles are given to you. Their locations are given to you. So that issue does never comes up. Yeah, good question, I don't know. Okay, so back to our problem. Um, okay, uh, I was hoping to get to another problem. Uh, this was rectilinear segment intersection. How am I doing with time? I'm almost out of time. Okay, let's see if I can get to this problem, uh, get at least parts of this problem explained quickly. Uh, this problem is called rectilinear segment intersection. You're given a bunch of line segments. They're all either horizontal lines or, or vertical lines. And your job is to report all intersections of these line segments. Okay. Uh, and you can see here, you're given a bunch of line segments, and the ones you need to report are obviously, uh, where is my mouse? There you go. Are this one here, uh, these two here, this one here, this one here, these two here. Oops, sorry. Uh, that one there, that one there, that one there, that one there, and then these three. Okay, those are the ones you have to report. Now, um, uh, there is a simple solution. You can take every horizontal line segment and, com and, and every vertical line segment, pair them up and see if they, if they intersect. If there is, they, you report it, otherwise you're, you, you move forward, right? The only problem there is that your time complexity is quadratic. It's, it's proportional to the product of the number of line, horizontal line segments and the number of vertical line segments, which is roughly n squared. 
if if you have an equal number of of uh, uh, horizontal and vertical line segments, you'll get n over two divided by multiplied by n over two, which is roughly n squared over four. That's a lot of intersections that you will go and test, and it's possible that none of them intersect. Okay. Instead, we would like to do this more efficiently. Uh, and in fact, uh, I will show you an algorithm that runs in time uh, n log n plus the actual number of intersections. Okay. So if the number of in intersections is large, if all the horizontal lines intersect all the vertical lines, well, you'll get a lot of intersection points, in which case the algorithm will spend a lot of time, but you have to report it anyways. So you have to do the job anyways. So that's justifiable cost. On the other hand, if things look like this, where you have only about a handful of different intersections, then it won't spend a lot of time. And it'll still spend n log n time, and you can prove that you can't get away with less than n log n. Okay. Is the problem clear to everyone? Okay. So, so in the remaining time, I'm going to show you some ideas for how this is approached. We're going to use something called a line sweep technique, where We'll take a vertical line, in this case, although you could easily well have done with a horizontal line. We're going to take a vertical line. We're going to start from over here, way out here. And we're going to slowly sweep it. And as we sweep it, we're, we're going to check for intersections along the way and report them. If there are none, there'll be none, none reported. Okay. So when it gets here, It'll report those three. When it gets here, it'll report that one. When it gets here, it'll report that one, and so on. So as it sweeps, it'll tell you all these. Now, of course, sweeping a line is an infinite process, because you have to, you have to look at every coordinate along the way, and it's, and it's a real line, so there are infinite points. So uh, does it really have to take infinite time? Well, it doesn't, because we know that all intersections happen only at the y coordinates, sorry, x coordinates of vertical lines. Okay, so this is at this x coordinate, or this x coordinate, or this x coordinate, or this x coordinate, or this x coordinate. These are the only points of interest. So this vertical line sweep is going to use an event based technique where it says, OK, uh, I know that something interesting is only going to happen at some events. And so, uh, yeah, I will sweep, but I'll go from event to event to event, which means that I'm only interested in the x coordinates of the vertical lines as far as the sweep is concerned. All right, so the sweep, even though I explained it as a sweep, it's simply going to jump from one, the x coordinate of the, the, of the first vertical line to the second, to the third, to the fourth, and so on, until it finishes. And as I do this, I'll report all the necessary intersections. Yeah. But at, at the red line, yeah. you're using the x coordinates, then would it report just one intersection or four? Well, uh, here I've shown it to you as, as in between the two vertical lines. When it gets here, it'll do some work, and I'll tell you what work it does, and it'll report only one. Now, here's the, here's the uh, uh, before I, I tell you all that, I have to go back and step back and tell you a little bit about data structures. And, and for the data structures, we need to understand a few things, and, and there may be people here who haven't taken data structures, so let me explain that. Is everyone clear about what's going on here? Okay. Okay. So we're going to use a simple data structure 
a, a balanced binary search tree data structure. Uh, how many of you have never heard of balanced binary search tree data structures? Okay, all right, that's fine. So a balanced, well, let me also not repeat that, that horrible sounding name. Uh, a data structure, first of all, is simply a structure or, a, or an abstract structure that stores some data and allows some operations on this, da on this data, okay? Uh, so we're going to be interested in data structures. Uh, first of all, as I said before, every data structure has two parts to it. One is uh, some information on what data it stores and another on what operations it's gonna perform on this data, okay? So even when I say data, I just mean what kind of data does it store? And here it says what kind of operations do I perform on it? So if you think of this as a, a classic example we give in data structures class is a, is a bank account. In a bank account, the data is the money you've, you've, uh, you have in your account and the operations you perform are uh, create an account, put in money or pull out money or simply ask for what's your balance. So the operations are, uh, are deposit, uh, uh, remove, or check your, your balance, uh, or even create an account if necessary. And the data is, of course, the money, right? Um, so that's a data structure as far as we are concerned, if we were to write a program. In our case, the data that we are going to store are going to be a bunch of numbers. By the way, we are interested in what are called as dynamic data structures. And dynamic data structures are data structures which are constantly changing in time. All right, things are constantly being inserted and deleted, just like in a bank. Uh, just like with a bank when, as uh, you know, you're allowed to make as many transactions as you want. And as you make transactions, things change. Your balance keeps changing. So that's an example of a dynamic data structure. We're interested in dynamic data structures and the data we are storing are, let, uh, they don't even have, sorry, it's not integers. They're a bunch of, they're a set of, of values, set of real values. Okay, so we're storing a set of real values and the operations we're going to perform, so these are a set of real values and the operations are going to be insert, delete, or search. These are your three basic operations for pretty much any data structure uh, and, and we'll stick to that. That's good enough at this point. Okay, so uh, and if you want you can also add one to say yeah, uh, uh, create a, a, an empty data structure with nothing in it. So, so let's also add something called create. So create will simply create an empty data structure then you can start to insert a value as you go along. Occasionally you can even delete one. And if you want, you can also search for one which simply says, tell me, uh, tell me if, if this value is in there. And in fact, the search will make it a little fancier as we go along. Uh, but for now, this is good enough. If you have this kind of, a, of an abstract data structure that's needed, it turns out that the best way to implement this is using something called a balanced binary search tree. Okay. Um, a, it's a search tree because it, it facilitates search. It's a binary search tree because the tree structure it uses is a, is a binary tree and uh, 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 also, it's called a binary search tree because it's, uh, it, it allows for search that mimics binary search. And finally, it's balanced because it's quite efficient and, and it keeps the tree reasonably balanced. For these balanced binary search trees, it turns out I can do inserts in log n time, deletes in log n time, and search in log n time where n is the number of items that, that are there in the data structure at that given time. And create, of course, I can create this in constant time because I'm creating an empty one. This is what is given to you. This is a data structure we're going to assume. Uh, 
uh, if and when you take the class, you'll get all the details that you ever want about these, these balanced binary search trees. By the way, a specific example of a binary, balanced binary search tree is called a red-black tree, uh, which, which is a nice implementation of, of these balanced binary search trees. Okay? So if I have a red-black tree, I can implement all of this. I can store a set of values, and I can insert, delete, or search any value at any given time, all in log n time. This is, this is what I need to know. So we're going to assume this data structure in order to solve this problem. Okay? So this is a data structure needed to, needed to solve this problem. How am I doing now? I am already past time. Yeah. Um, so let me quickly tell you the secret sauce here. So we're going to sweep this vertical line. And you'll see that, that the vertical line encounters three types of events, three event types. Um, it, may, uh, it may encounter the start of a horizontal line. It may encounter the end of a horizontal line. Or it may encounter a vertical line, a vertical line segment. So this is what I mean by an event-based approach to solving the problem. So we're going to sweep the vertical line, and the only x-coordinates we are interested in are one of these things. Each of these is an x-coordinate. Start of a horizontal line is an x-coordinate. End of a horizontal line is another x-coordinate. And a, the vertical line segment has an x-coordinate, right? Those are the only three event types this guy is going to be interested in. Now, when you hit the start of a horizontal line, what we know is that the vertical line is now passing over this horizontal line. And so we're going to take its y coordinate and we're going to store it, store it in this data structure. OK? And, and when it ends, we're going to remove it. So at the start, we store the y-coordinate in the data structure. At the end, we remove it. Because once the horizontal line is finished, the vertical line is not interested in that horizontal line segment anymore because it's not going to be a cause of any intersections. Fine? So now I have to tell you what this, what this vertical line sweep does when you hit a vertical line segment. Now remember, the key is that in this data structure, I don't just store a set of y values, I store the y coordinates. Even though my vertical line is sweeping by x coordinates, I am going to store in this data structure y coordinates, which really means that at any given time, the vertical line is going to look like this. And there are a bunch of horizontal line segments that it has seen, and all these guys it has stored in the data structure according to its y coordinate. Okay, so it's got a, a data structure. I'm going to draw it like that, and it's got these four values stored somewhere in this in this data structure. Now it encounters a vertical line. Let me draw a so, so here is a vertical line. That's a vertical line. When the, when the line sweep hits that vertical line, we're going to look for intersections of that line segment with the horizontal lines that are, in, uh, that are active at this time. And everything active is sitting here in this data structure. So this data structure is basically a data structure of active horizontal line segments. When I get this vertical line segment, I know the y-coordinates of the two endpoints. 
I'm going to essentially search for them in this data structure and report everything in between them. Okay, and it turns out I can, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, take the search and I'm going to implement it so that it doesn't just search for me, but it searches with, a, with, a, with, with two values and reports everything in between. So I have to modify this a little bit, but it turns out I can still do it in roughly log n time, but plus the number of, of intersections it makes. So when it hits this, it will, it will figure out that this guy is, is higher than all the other y values, whereas this guy is between the second and the third y value. And so it'll report everything in between, and those are all going to be intersections. And that's it. Uh, I will tell you details next time. I will stop here for now. So the algorithm turns out to be quite simple. You have something called the event queue, then you have something called that data structure. With those two pieces, you can solve the problem in what is called n log n plus the number of intersections. Time to stop.